existence. So Nietzsche says God is dead. Partly to say he's a militant atheist. But partly to say that the idea of God in the minds of men has died. Which means that theoretically it may not have completely died, but is in a point of collapse. Because the point is to test and to rearrange. And you put up a view and I will attack it. Because life is struggle. And in that struggle comes out the possibility of meaning. Nietzsche would say, there is a truth, but I don't know it yet. Drive buy me another drink. There is a degree to which ontological circumstances cannot be completely proved, but are not rendered prior meaningless. Which is why Nietzsche approaches nihilism. The belief that there is no purpose, and no values, and no constraints, and no morals that aren't purely human, and that there is nothing outside. Which, of course, makes it very difficult to run any sort of a civilization because there are no lines. And Nietzsche stands halfway between what you might call this existential leftist praxis and Heidegger. Nietzsche has become extremely fashionable on the left in the last 30 years. And there's lots of postmodernist books by people like Deleuze and Guattari and these sorts of people who love the element of Nietzsche that tears down. I come as a destroyer. Because in order to create, you've got to destroy first. You've got to level off a bit. There's ruins around him, so you give him a bit of a push. All of Nietzsche's thinking before Zarathustra, when he begins to vouchsafe his own view, if you like, is largely a tearing down. Tearing down of the normative nature of ethics in the genealogy of morals. Tearing down of the idea of truth itself. An erection of science in works like the Dawn, or the joyful wisdom stroke the gay science, and then the tearing down of the idea of science. A playing up of certain Darwinian and evolutionary ideas, which Nietzsche is actually quite suspicious of, because he doesn't think that life is, and circumstances are linear at all. He believes they're circular. And everything that was comes back again. He thinks Darwin and Darwinists are cretinous materialists and shallow optimists. Look at the people around you. Are they progressing and moving upwards, or are they just dullards led by a few people at the top who manipulate them? Now, Heidegger made a radical, possibly the most radical choice, philosophically and politically, in the century that's just passed. Admittedly, he was living in Germany at a time when, if the left liberal consensus would have it, the most controversial regime in the 20th century came to power. Now, if you were in other races or in other societies, you would actually refute that. You'd say Stalin's or Lenin's or Mao's or various other regimes were more important. You could argue that the most important regime in the 20th century is the American one. But put all that on another table for today. Heidegger decided in 1933 to join the Nazi Party, to join the National Socialist German Workers' Party, and gave lectures for a year in his university in full Nazi uniform, and was involved with all of the other party gauleiters and other figures in his area. To the shock and horror and consternation of much of the academic elite uh, that he was associated with. And don't forget that Heidegger did this for purely speculative and theoretical reasons. Heidegger had no concern with doctrines of race, no concerns with doctrines of conspiracy, no concerns with politics at all. Politics was irrelevant in relation to placing man before death, which was what life was about. And what he liked about this movement was that he thought it was a primordial movement that was bringing back, almost in an occultistic way, the partiality towards death, that in some ways it was bringing back the ancient world with modern technology. That's why he reached out to it. Now, he regarded democracy just like middle-brow secular humanism, as a deviation. Because in a sense, his nature is so sort of primordially prior and religious that he considers almost all normal life to be irrelevant. Family, having a good time, pleasure. Pleasure as a principle for life, which in liberal theory is cardinal. The American Constitution talks about liberty, talks about property, talks about happiness. Heidegger doesn't think the purpose of life is happiness. The purpose of life is death and facing ontology. But he doesn't put it in the vocabulary that you must fall before the one who is on the cross, who bleeds for us. Because in a sense, Heidegger just increasingly sees those as forms, as metaphors for metaphors, as stuff that needs to be put out of the way someone can concentrate on the cardinal things of life, death, spirituality, 
and the possible existence of God. God, as he told Paul Chelan when they met in 67, has always been with me. Now, Chelan's interesting, of course, as a Jewish poet who wrote in German, for which he was condemned by his own group, and converted to Catholicism because of uh, Heidegger's influence. And that was not, not a sectarian influence, because Heidegger was totally uninterested in what sect people were in, and so on. These are all forms that have no importance. And in some ways, there's a great paradox, because Heidegger's thinking is so purely, transcendently extreme, that he's one of the few figures where the pagan-Christian split I'm collapsing into the screen, aren't I? The pagan-Christian split in our civility doesn't really mean anything to him. This is one of the things that interests me very much about him. But uh, with this right-wing group, for example, a few Christians turned up early, they went, and it's largely pagan in orientation. Uh, in the new rights in Europe and so on, you have this very great split between the two. Heidegger's almost totally unconcerned with those things because the forms that people worship being in being through are incidental to placing man before ontological prerequisite. His view is you base life and society upon the profound thinking that will impinge upon a man of full consciousness, not physically debilitated, before his moment of death. And that's why he joined the Nazi party. That's why virtually no one could understand why he joined it. Because he was totally sort of unorthodox in ideological terms, because he had very little interest in that. After a year, he sort of realised that, um, one, probably, they, at a crude level, they didn't understand what he was on about. Two, that he was having to make political decisions in the university and the library and its use in something he didn't agree with. And he fell away. And he left the party then and continued to... to um, teaching the university until 1945. In 1945, he was prescribed by uh, uh, denazification tribunals that were set up in the Western Allied zones. Now, he was forbidden from teaching in post-war Germany, even though all sorts of people had him as a guest lecturer, so they used to get, get round it that way. And you had this strange situation where he became a sort of moral and spiritual leper in post-war Germany, and yet he was extremely respected. So Dr. Heidegger, Professor Heidegger, was everywhere, and at the same time didn't even have a university post. And there's all sorts of interesting things, because Herschel taught him that because Herschel was a Jew, he was banned from the university library, but after the war, Heidegger was banned from the library, and Jaspers wrote to educational authorities in Germany saying you shouldn't be given a post. So you have all of this as well. But there was a play a couple of weeks ago actually on the BBC by John Banville, an Irish writer, about Heidegger that was very interesting. And it's a dramatisation because all dramatists are interested in dialectic. They're interested in two minds, if it's a theoretical play of any sort. Two minds coming together that disagree and the tension and the charge and the flow of energy that occurs between those two minds and whether you can make a narrative out of it that can be listened to from beginning to end. And it's this talk in his hut in the Black Forest. Because very interestingly, there is almost inevitably a monastic element to Heidegger. Heidegger goes in, into the woods in primal inner Germany to sit there in the middle of this forest and dwell upon death and write a book of 450 pages of, um, probably, of, to certain Anglo-Saxon minds, sheer intellectual torture, virtually, in order to get nearer to the truth, that is the truth, that is the truth, that will not set you free, but release you to die with some dignity. Because that's the only truth that matters. And there's a sort of um, divine element to it, in a way, because it's so near to the inexpressible. Um, artistically, of course, in a blowback sense, it's had an enormous influence on novelists in Germany like Hermann Brock and these sorts of things. He wrote The Death of Virgil and he wrote the book called The Sleepwalkers and so on. And this extraordinary capacity for intellectual abstraction that many German writers have, they begin with a sort of a, a relatively straightforward narrative and suddenly launch off into ultimate speculative questions, very much influenced by this type of theory. But I don't think people who are illiberal can understand the shock in liberal intellectual...